So in this session we are looking at primarily what next from here. After the first session, where we looked at where rupee stands as a global currency. In the second session, we looked at the macroeconomic fundamental foundation required to make rupee an internationalized currency. And now we are looking at way forward. What next? To look at the future and what next, we we have a visionary panel which is coming up right after the presentation. And for the presentation, I will call upon Ms. Bhargavi Javeri who is going to provide a presentation and the data which will enable a healthy discussion in the panel. So, let me welcome Bhargavi Javeri. She is currently associated with National Institute of Public Policy, Public Finance and Policy. She is a legal consultant and at NIPFP, she works in the areas of financial regulation and policy. Her areas of interest include capital controls, securities, markets, banking regulations and policy. Before joining NIPFP, she was a research fellow at the Harvard Law School, where she researched on policy making processes in India, with a particular focus on exchange control policies. Prior to that, she worked with a Mumbai based law firm, where she advised on matters involving foreign exchange regulations, corporate and commercial law. She is a qualified lawyer and a solicitor by profession. So please join me in welcoming Bhargavi Jave. Who 
others who had to consume medicines twice or thrice a day were finding it really difficult to open the caps and therefore they, they were leaving the bottles open. This led to a spike in the number of children accessing open bottles, consuming, consuming pills and as you can imagine grandparents have, uh, old people have medicines more often than young and therefore most of the deaths are happening in the grandparents' home. So what, I mean, where did they go wrong here? Where did they go wrong here? They went wrong here in identifying the exact market failure. The market failure was not that bottles could be opened easily. The market failure was that parents were not conscious enough of the dangers of keeping medicine accessible to a child. It was information asymmetry. Now you can see when you identify a problem wrongly, you end up enacting a regulation which has unintended consequences. So this is what I want, this is what I mean by smart regulation. Identify the problem, then choose the right solution to resolve that very problem and do nothing more. And I'll explain how we have gone wrong on uh, in the capital controls framework in you know really taking this into account. Um, yeah, smart education of course requires a variety of skills on the table. No single public administrator, no single lawyer, no single economist, no single engineer can draft a perfect law. You need all those skills on the table to really draft the perfect law, the right level of intervention. And therefore, we talk about stakeholder consultation. Of course, cost benefit analysis is one of the major other components, especially when we talk about ease of doing business. What do I mean by cost benefit analysis? When I enact a law, what is the cost that it imposes on consumers? What is the cost that it imposes on businesses? What is the cost that it imposes on the government to administer that law? These are the factors which really go into making smart regulation. Now, um, why, why, why are we even bothering with all this? I mean, why can't we just amend our FEMA? Why can't we just, uh, why can't we just amend the FEMA regulations uh, on a daily basis and just fix this problem? One is that the groundwork of our law, from which most of the regulations emerge, regulations are delegated legislation, right? You have the primary law, you have the delegated law. Most of our primary laws were enacted at a time when India was a largely controlled economy. So we have RBI Act, which was enacted in 1934, when nobody was clear about monetary policy frameworks or in the concept. We have the Banking Regulation Act, which was enacted pre nationalization, and we have the FEMA, which was uh, enacted in the wake of the Asian. Financial crisis. So, uh, although it's, it's a liberalization from FEDA, still it replicates FEDA in many respects. So, any talk about internationalizing the rupee must take into account these considerations. That was the limited point of this, uh, of uh, these paras on uh, rule of law, etc. Now, going back to the topic that we've been talking about since morning, what do you mean by internationalization? When is the rupee a truly international currency? One is when it, I think most of the panels have concluded that one is when it is a me, used as a medium of exchange, not only between Indian residents and others, but also between two people who have nothing to do with India. Two is when rupee is used as a store of value, that is when people around the world have enough faith in the rupee to invest in a rupee denominated asset. And three, of course, the, the litmus test of whether a, true, whether a currency is truly international is when it is held as an international, uh, when it has held as a reserve by international financial institutions and perhaps in sovereigns. So, let's begin with what changes that we need in FEMA. Now, under FEMA, we classify all transactions into current account transactions, which are mainly your trade, etc., and capital account. We are a fully current, currently account, current account converted in country, and therefore we have considerable freedom in the way we do trade with others. This is under the law. Now let's see whether de facto, whether in fact we have a truly fully convertible current account economy. There is a section in FEMA which allows the central government to impose reasonable restrictions on current account transactions. There is no, uh, it does not require that the restriction should be limited in time. There are no considerations for when the restriction should be imposed. Compare that to a truly fully convertible current account convertible country like South Korea, where there are very, very small, where there are strict considerations on which the central government can even impose restrictions on current account convertibility. Now, what are some of the restrictions that we have really seen? Okay, so we talk about invoicing in the rupee and how now uh, invoicing can, trade invoicing can be done in the rupee, etc. But under the foreign trade policy of India, all exports are to be realized in a fully convertible currency. 
So you made one single rupee, but you got to realize the money in a fully convertible currency, which is obviously not a rupee. So that's one of the uh, one of the restrictions that the central government imposed. But time to time, we often see the number of months within which exporters are supposed to realize their uh, export dues has reduced from 12 to 9 months, 9 to 6 months. We see these changes on an ongoing basis. Say for example, the restriction that the money line, the currency line in the uh, export earner's foreign currency account, which is a fully current account uh, 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 proceeds held account, is one month. You've got to convert that money into rupees within the next calendar month. Are we really truly fully a current account convertible? Let's talk about for one minute about the concept of trade finance. Trade finance both intuitively and even under the definition of current account under FEMA is a current account transaction. However, we still seek to regulate it under the ECB framework which is meant for capital account transactions. We impose interest rates on trade, we impose interest rate caps on trade finance, we impose minimum maturity of periods for trade finance, etc. So this is this is where I really question whether we are truly fully current account convertible. Now, my job here is not only to uh, highlight the problems, but since it's way forward, here's what I would think to be truly fully current account convertible, how we need to change our framework. First of all, there are of course KYC and anti-money laundering issues. Since we are only limited capital account convertible, but fully current account convertible, it means that the government has to ensure that the money which goes out for a current account transaction is not illegally used for a capital account transaction. That is what we mean by, uh, you know, why we need to even have, say, reporting requirements, etc. So those problems are be solved in two ways. One is you have a strong anti-money laundering framework which is enforced equally as strongly. Two is you have robust KYC standards. Once you have those in place, there is no requirement for imposing approval uh, uh, requirements before undertaking current account transactions uh, or even caps on the amount of money that you can send abroad for current account transactions. So this is this is a truly current account convertible economy where the law does not require you to get previous approval for remitting money for current account transactions. Have a post reporting, a robust post reporting, uh, post transaction reporting framework. Um, okay, moving on to capital account. Now the second thing that we discuss for the rupee to be a truly convertible currency, a truly international currency, is where. Uh, people are able to hold it as a store of value in rupee denominated assets. Like everybody has already mentioned, we've seen some positive developments on that front in the recent times. We've seen uh, liberalization of the rupee denominated bonds abroad. We've seen very little liberalization of the ECB framework. Uh, we've seen the depository receipt scheme, which again, people, which allows people abroad to hold Indian shares through depository receipts, etc. Now, going back to smart regulation. Let's think a minute about our ECB framework. Now what is ECB framework? Okay, so you have 24 pages of uh, rules which dictate how much money can I borrow in foreign currency from whom, whether I can borrow or not, whether I am eligible to borrow or not, how much interest I can pay, where should I park the proceeds, what should I use it for. So these are all the restrictions that we have in the ECB framework today. But let's step back a moment, keeping in mind smart regulation. Okay, let's let's see that I hope we are not becoming the case of the childproof cap in India. What is the market failure really associated with ECB? As the previous panel, as uh, Sajid mentioned on the previous panel, the market failure really is, and the risk that really we are exposed, we are exposing our residents to, is the currency risk that may arise from taking foreign denominated borrowings. Now, if that is the market failure then what is the intervention that we have selected? We have selected the intervention you may borrow from XYZ, but you cannot borrow from ABC. We have selected the intervention that you can only pay this much interest on a foreign currency denominated borrowing. Wouldn't it be smart regulation to really cover, make sure that the resident who borrows in foreign currency hedges his foreign currency exposure? Is that, would it be the only state level intervention that you would really require to resolve the single market failure that arises from the ECB, uh, from borrowing in foreign currency uh, from, from abroad? So, that is 
uh, something that we need to think about. Are we really being smart and regulated in our foreign currency borrowings? Now, what is the unintended consequence from this uh, uh, manufacturing the childproof child proof cap requirement? Okay. So let's see. In 2007, now ECB has several other nuances, right? There is the there is the approval route. There is the uh, automatic route. Under the approval route, you can borrow for allocation for uh, 2G spectrum bids. But under the government route, you will have to borrow for 3G spectrum allocation, etc. Now. Um, in 2007, it was specified that ECB beyond 20 million for, uh, uh, may be borrowed under the automatic route for non-rupee denominated expenditure. So what did we see? We, said we saw that most firms intended using it for cheap imports and the number of imports in 2007 actually went up. And the moment this restriction was removed, the number dropped. So, I mean, are we, are we, we have to really rethink, ground up whether ECB, the ECB framework that we have in place today is smart regulation or not. Um, another thing on capital account, of course, there are several restrictions on. Uh, so, today, a private company in India cannot really invest in securities abroad except I bet he wants to. I mean, you cannot gain exposure to the capital markets abroad. It is allowed only for listed companies that to the law decides how much of the percentage of the net worth of the listed company can you really expose its capital market, can you really take an exposure worth abroad. I mean, uh, what is the point of doing that? The listed company is answerable to shareholders. It has enough regulations in India to control the way it is accountable to shareholders. Why should the law dictate that a listed company cannot take capital markets exposure abroad in excess of 50% of its net worth? Is that smart regulation? And is it really resolving the problem? So those are the, some of the things that I wanted to highlight on the capital account legal framework that we have. Now, even as we speak about, uh, suppose for a minute, we take it that, okay, the only market failure arising from ECB is foreign currency exposure, as was also indicated by, I think they concur on the previous panel. And we mandate hedging requirements. So the next obvious question, which everybody has been talking about since morning is, uh, do we even have a market, a currency derivatives market where hedging can take place? Where do residents go if you mandate hedging requirements? Uh, just a note here that the ECB policy does not mandate hedging requirements, although the market failure is foreign currency exposure. So the hedging requirements are kind of scattered and are all over the place. There's no mandatory hedging requirement for any So assuming for a minute we become smart and we say, okay, ECB policy will now say that if you take foreign currency exposure to borrowings, please make sure you hedge your foreign currency risk. So then the question is where do we hedge? So we go to the exchange traded currency derivatives market because that is the safest market for derivatives. Okay, well, now what are the problems that we face? Okay, so let's say RBI mandates, the regulatory framework really mandates very limited products that can be traded on the exchange in exchange traded in the exchange currency derivatives. Of uh, the contract size, the minimum maturity, etc. Now, in this given situation, we keep talking about are we liquid enough, are, is our market liquid enough, is our market liquid enough, but our regulatory framework does not allow our markets to be liquid enough. That is, that is really the biggest takeaway from all the conversations that we had today. Now, this is kind of very contrary to the way the rest of the world seeks to regulate currency derivatives. The rest of the world insists that try and standardize your products, try and push your products on the exchange so that everybody, so that there is a transparent market for currency derivatives. We say no, trade only for products on the exchange and the remaining let's go to OTC. Even in the OTC market, we are severely hindered. Um, okay, I think I've done So uh, even in the OTC market, we are severely hindered in terms of the regulatory framework dictates who can buy. If assuming X can is allowed to buy, why should, uh, how, what kind of exposure should X show so that he's allowed to buy on the OTC market? What is the limit of the contract? What is, whether he can rebook the contract, whether he can cancel the contract? I mean, is this really smart regulation? What is really the market failure in an OTC market? So, the market failure in an OTC market is a systemic risk that arises from counterparty default. And that is why you see the rest of the world the way they are seeking to regulate their OTC market is to moving towards standardization of contracts, pushing them on the exchange, where that is not possible, mandating central counterparty clearing, mandating man margin requirements.
requirements, but nowhere is the regulation intruding on what should be the size of your contract, uh, uh, who can buy what, what should be the, what should be the kind of exposure that you should be allowed to if you uh, purely buy a particular product. So that is something that we really need to think about. Are we being smart in regulating our OTC market? Is it resolving the market failure? Um, coming back to the topic, coming on the last topic, that is taxation. So again, uh, rule of law issues in taxation, we all have spoken again ad nauseum about the unpredictability of uh, suddenly taxing non-residents, the MAT or FBI issue, etc. However, at a very basic level, we need to really consider how are we regulating capital gains that arise to non-residents from sale of assets. We keep, uh, we keep counting Mauritius as a tax haven and we keep insisting that the Mauritius tax treaty has to be renegotiated just so that uh, investors don't come to Mauritius. But the fact of the matter is that our sourcing norms have to be changed for the way we think about capital gains that arise to non-residents from sale of assets in India. So if you see the OECD model convention, it lays down the world standard, and lays down the global standard of the way you tax capital gains that arise to non-residents. Gains from the alienation of any property shall be taxable only in the state of which the alienator is a resident. So let's uh, take a practical example. If India private limited, if India limited sells its shares in America Inc. and makes capital gains out of it, he will be taxed both in America and he will be taxed only in India. He won't be taxed in America because India is the contracting state of the alienator. However, if America Inc. sells its shares in India private limited or India limited and makes capital gains out of it, he will be taxed in India as well as in America. Now, this is, this is not the way America has negotiated the rest of its treaties. This is not the way any OECD country has negotiated the rest of its tax treaties. If we need to revisit something, it's the need to revisit every other treaty which allows us to tax capital gains of non-residents arising from in sale of Indian assets. Um, so, that's the limited point there. Also, I want to speak a little about the best framework, the, uh, the base erosion profit shifting framework that has been making headlines for some time now. Now what is that? That is about rationalizing the way countries tax residents and non-residents across the globe. If the BEPS framework really works out, then what it means is that India will not be able to tax America Inc. for sale of its shares in India in India. So unless we choose to take an exception from that rule, we will have to come on par with OECD standards in the way we choose to tax uh, non-residents on sale of their Indian assets. We need to change our sourcing norms to make sure that we do not end up creating more Mauritius or more Singapore, which are nothing but really an answer to our treaties not complying with OECD standards. Um, so uh, my point here is that uh, when we talk about internationalization of the rupee and we talk about what changes to be really needed in our taxation frameworks, we must think about the competitiveness of the rupee before we impose any tax measure and rule of law, unpredictability, etc. are some of the basic considerations. Thank you so much, Bhargavi, for the uh, uh, wonderful insights and more importantly, defining uh, the first step, which is identification of the problem, before even you start addressing it. And you focus on the smart regulations. 